All right, here we go. My name is Nadine Manset. Amongst other things at CPHT, I am the instrument scientist for Espadons. I will present to you today this wonderful instrument. The name Espadons actually stands for something. It stands for a shell spectropolarimetric device for the observation of stars. So the name tells you that we can do spectroscopy or spectropolarimetry. Well, the name doesn't tell you that we do that in the optical with this instrument. We get for each exposure, like in one shot, wavelengths from 370 nanometers up to a little bit above one micron in 40 spectral orders. The peak resolution will depend on the configuration of the instrument. It can be either around 69,000 or 80,000. And of course, the spectral resolution varies across the different spectral orders. The faintest objects we can do are around a magnitude V of 15 or 16. That's pushing it for espadons because we have a 3.6 meter telescope. And that means that for those targets, we can do spectroscopy with a signal to noise ratio of five to 10 in about an hour. But the targets that we do more commonly are magnitudes between 8 and 13 or so. By using calibration lamps, we can get a RMS accuracy of about 100 to 150 meters per second. Again, that varies across the spectral orders. However, each spectrum has telluric lines with known wavelengths, and we can use that information, the data reduction software uses that, to refine the wavelength calibration, and we can reach an accuracy which is a little bit better, 20 to 30 meters per second. So Espadon is not doing one to two meter per second uh, radio velocity measurements. It's an order of magnitude bigger than that, one or two orders of magnitude. I will note, however, that the most recent instrument at CFHT is a near-infrared spectral polarimeter called SPIRU, and SPIRU is capable of doing one to two meter per second radio velocity measurements. Espadons is one of five instruments at CFHT. It was received in 2004 and was offered to PIs in December of the same year. We started in classical mode, and then in 2008, we changed to queued service observing mode, which means that CFHT staff during the day prepares the list of observations we want to carry in the upcoming night, and we have trained observers that perform those observations. PIs do not need to travel to uh, Hawaii anymore. Over the past, I would say, three or four years, Espadons was installed at the telescope maybe 30 nights per semester. Now, with the arrival of Spiru, uh, this has increased a little bit. So we do between 14 and 20 nights per semester during bright time. What does Espadons look like? Uh, we first start with what we call the calibrate, Cassegrain calibration unit that you see here at the Cassegrain focus of the telescope. So you have a human for scale, and it's only the bottom part uh, of what you see below the telescope. The Cassegrain unit gets the F8 telescope beam. It includes calibration lamps, uh, acquisition and guiding camera, and also the optics necessary to do polarization measurements. At the bottom of that unit, we have optical fibers that are about 30 meters long, and they go down two floors below the telescope to a crane room where the spectrograph is installed. The spectrograph is bench mounted, and you see here a picture uh, that was taken in 2004 when we were assembling the different parts of the spectrograph on the optical bench. So not quite finished there. The detector, which is not shown here, is now a deep depletion E2V detector. The spectrograph is in a thermal enclosure, which helps minimize the variations due to changes in temperature and pressure. And that makes the instrument a little bit more stable. And that enclosure sits on pneumatic feet, 
which minimizes the effects of vibrations and also earthquakes, which we do get from time to time on Mauna Kea. Right before the arrival of Spiru, which sits in the same Kude room, we uh, brought some improvements. We, add it, we added a, a tarp, very black thick material uh, that we put around the thermal enclosure to prevent light leaks. And then we added some sort of room around that to further decrease light leaks and uh, variations of temperature and pressure. So now, even if we are observing with Espadons, in the Kude room, we can do some work with Spiru without risking interferences. Then what can you do with that wonderful instrument? We have three observing modes. Uh, one of them is uh, just doing spectroscopy on stars, the star only mode. So once again, we get all the wavelengths in each exposure. And in that mode, the light of the star goes to an aperture which has a diameter of 1.6 arc seconds. We take that round image of a star and we slice it with a optical device called a slicer. We slice that into six slices that we stack one above the other. That creates the image of a pseudo slit that we send through the spectrograph. And that way we can get a peak spectral resolution of about 80,000. We have another spectroscopic mode called star plus sky. And as the name indicates, we get not only the spectrum of the star, but we also get the spectrum of the sky. The picture shown at the bottom uh, actually shows you the two aperture holes. The smaller one uh, near the bottom is the one for the star. And then at a fixed distance, you have a slightly bigger hole through which we can get the light of the sky at a fixed position. We don't have control over that. Since we have to cram two spectra on the same exposure, we slice the round images into three slices only. And when we stack those three slices, the pseudo slit is a little bit fatter, which means that in this mode, the spectral resolution is only about 68, 69,000 at maximum. Finally, we can do spectral polarimetry. In that mode, we take four exposures for each of the Stokes parameter, which is, which is desired. So we can do circular polarization with Stokes V for exposures. We can do also linear polarization with eight exposures that will cover, cover Stokes Q and U. The data reduction software removes the polarization in the continuum and the projects are using the polarization in lines, spectral lines, absorption or emission to do their science. This is a part of a typical image that was taken in the spectral polarimetric mode. Each more or less vertical stripe of light is a spectral order. And within an order, you see two beams. So the two polarization states uh, the dark lines are absorption lines, and the very thick and broad ones are, I'm pretty sure, telluric lines. So that's what a raw image looks like. We do provide PIs with fully reduced observations. So with three modes, we have dozens of applications. You know, spectroscopy, we can determine spectral type, temperatures, age, composition. Is a star a system? Is it a binary? If it's a binary, what are the orbital parameters? We have done studies of the interstellar medium. We're doing a little bit of exoplanet studies too. In spectral polarimetry, the emphasis is on magnetic fields, detecting a magnetic field or measuring their strength or how they vary over time. We can also study spots, either dark spots or bright spots at the surface of stars and also study stellar activity like flares. Some of the very first results from 2005 include a study done by Wade et al. that showed that 10% of Herbig AEB stars, which are young, hot, massive, and blue, have a magnetic field. And that's an interesting result because it fits with the fact that about 10% of AP BP stars, which are the older, more evolved version, if you want, 
are also have a magnetic field. So there seems to be a connection between the young version of those stars and the more evolved version. The magnetic field stays there. Also the same year, a paper came out about the discovery of a 1000 Gauss magnetic field in the innermost part of the disk of a young cool star called Fu Orionis. A little bit later, uh, we reported or PIs reported the first detection, uh, direct measurement of a magnetic field for a star that has a planet, Tau Bootis. And also we observed the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, and it was determined that it has a weak magnetic field. And uh, the discovery of a magnetic field for an O star was also reported. So that was 2013. And at that time, it was the second O star only to have a detected magnetic field. And then a little bit later, or around that same time, in the star ever measured, a star in AGC, NGC 1624. Turns out that that object has uh, 10 times the uh, magnetic field typically found around high, other high mass stars. It's a star which is uh, massive, 35 solar masses, and will live only 5 million years. There was also a discovery of a, of a magnetic field that changed in a star. A star that was observed over five years between 2004 and 2009, and during that period of time, it was stable. The magnetic field was, was determined to be bipolar. And then observations in 2011, 2012 showed a change. The magnetic field axis moved. And the explanation that has been put forth is that there was a dis disruption caused by a new dynamo field. And that new field was in turn produced because the star started to be convective. So convection, dynamo, and the magnetic field changed. And that was detected and caught within a few years. This is uh, what we can get expert on when we follow a star over time. Uh, and then create a configuration of the magnetic field and see where the spots are and how the, the loops connect from one side of the star to another. We have also done a little bit of solar system studies. For example, uh, the uh, exosphere or the very thin atmosphere of Mercury was uh, discovered or measured and reported in 2010. The uh, graph shows you the sodium doublet, basically, and the dark line uh, refers to what was observed for Mercury. So you do see that there is emission at that location in the spectrum. We also done direct wind measurement, uh, velocity measurements for Venus that we observe during the day when the co configuration is favorable every two to three years. And you can see uh, the little image to the right shows you the surface of Venus with the two aperture holes. So if Venus is big enough, we can map and make take measurements uh, over all its surface to map the wind velocity. Thanks to the success, the interest in uh, evidence, we had, have had three rounds of large programs, programs that extend over a few semesters and request a big amount of nights. Uh, we started with magnetism in massive stars, mines, and magnetic protostars and planets map in 2008 to 2012. This was followed by a study about the binarity and magnetic interactions in various classes of stars, binanics, and also magnetic topologies of young stars and the survival of close-in massive exoplanets from 2013 to 2016. And then we had a smaller large program that lasted uh, just a few semesters about the history of the magnetic sun. One of the large programs uh, had an interesting results. This is just one example uh, actually of many different discoveries. Um, and the question that was possibly answered is when do hot Jupiters migrate close to their star? Is it early on? So the, the, the Jupiter massive planet is formed away from the star 
But then early on, there's still a disk around the star, and then somehow the disk interacts with the Jupiter and brings it closer? Or, or is it something, a migration that happens later when other planets are formed, and maybe the other planets interact with the Jupiter mass planet to bring it close to the star? Observations of a young star, V830 tau, indicate that for that system, there might be a hot Jupiter, so a massive planet close to the star, which would indicate then that migration can happen early on in the life of a stellar system, even when there's still a disk. So there's probably something going on with the disk that can influence the position of a, a planet of a mass like Jupiter. A more recent uh, result discovery, it was actually a study of Betelgeuse from 2009 to 2017, something that was published in 2018. The top line of this graph shows you the line profile from hundreds of lines in the spectrum of Betelgeuse. And this was really high signal to noise observations about 2000 per spectrum. In, uh, when people do spectral polarimetry, the polarization signal is usually very, very, very small, which means that within a single line, it's usually not possible to see if there is a polarization signal. What has to be done is to co-add hundreds or even thousands of lines and look at that to see if there's a polarization signal. This is what is shown in the middle panel in red. You see Stokes V, so for circular and within the line, which is so shown at the top, you do see that the polarization goes from negative and it flips and it gets positive. And it's a strong signal. Strong, but very small. And without uh, hundreds of lines, we would not be able to see or measure that signal. This can be used with models to uh, figure out that the magnetic field on Betelgeuse is about one Gauss, not very strong. So in conclusion, Espadons is a shell spectropolymetric device for the observation of stars, although we have done solar system studies. We can do spectroscopy or spectropolymetry in the optical with a pretty good resolution with targets as bright as Sirius, but we can go as faint as magnitude 15 or 16. We cannot do you know, very precise or very accurate radio velocity measurements, but for, for a lot of projects, that's all that is needed. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm available to answer them right now. And you can also send me an email later on if you want. Thank you, Nadine. Does anyone have any questions for Nadine about Espadons, its capabilities, how it's used um, as an American, how you can have access to it? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Padma. I'm uh, from Space Science Institute. I am very curious about uh, spectrophotopolarimetry, but of comets in the uh, in both in the planet, uh, solar system and exoplanetary system. Uh -huh. Has anybody tried uh, any observations, or are there any results uh, from such a uh, application? I cannot remember if we have done uh, spectropolarimetry of comets. What I know from comets is that the polarization is usually in the continuum. Uh, and I don't know what, exactly what happens in the lines. If the lines are polarized, that would be interesting to measure with espadons. Uh, but if the most useful information comes from the polarization in the continuum, espadons is not very good at doing that. I see. I'm not sure myself, but I've been hearing a lot about magnetic circular polarization of comets with the indication of uh, magnetic fields, mostly in their tails, and also identification of different uh, materials like sodium and a couple of other items that are circularly polarized, I believe, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, so this is just recent uh, work that I've been hearing about hearsay, and I'm looking for uh, an option to be able to apply for this kind of uh, experiment. 
So I would love to know when the application date is as a US uh, scientist, but, um, and I have observed a Mona Kea, so I don't know if that helps or not to an application, but uh, I would love to know how to do that. Uh, CFHC is open for proposals twice a year. Uh, the next semester will open in towards the end of February with a deadline around March 21st, and that's going to be proposals for semester 21B. And for uh, American astronomers, if you have a Canadian colleague, you can submit your proposal through the Canadian Time Allocation Committee. If you have a UH or a French colleague, you can use the UH committee or the French committee. And mm -hmm. if, if that doesn't work, there's always the, the possibility of requesting directors the discretionary time. There are a few nights set aside at each semester and the director can at his discretion pick programs that are submitted and then pro, uh, you know, uh, allow uh, a few nights of uh, observations. I see, well, thank you, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Salut Nidhi, uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, have you used espadons for galactic or extragalactic studies, looking at something other than stars? Yes, we have, and it's very difficult. Uh, I was involved in a project. It was a uh, another galaxy. It was quite a while back, and we were trying to observe the brightest spots in the core of a galaxy, and we were not really reaching the signal to noise required to do much much of anything of use. Uh, so it's a, a real challenge to do extragalactic uh, targets because they're fainter. And I, I guess that's the, the bottom line. I think we also did the brightest quasar or something like that. And it was just spectroscopy with a signal to noise of maybe 10, 10, 20, 30. Uh, but again, it was the brightest source of that kind and it's very difficult to record a signal and then analyze it to make sense of it. Okay, thank you. That's that's what I had in mind. I was thinking for the spectral polarimeter, it would be fantastic for extragalactic objects, but of course the sensitivity is a huge issue. So thank you. Yeah, we need a bigger telescope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Nadine? Yes, uh, I have a quick question. I just want to, as a PR outreach, what is it that the most exciting result has been with this instrument as well as the uh, in air infrared Spiro? Uh, so for Hespadons, we do so many different things that it's, um, you know, we can usually talk about magnetic fields. So just showing an image of a star that is rotating and because we followed it, we can figure out the configuration of the magnetic field and you see it rotate in space. That's pretty cool uh, to, to show. And you can explain that, uh, you know, you get raw data, which looks like stripes of light. And then, but there's a lot of data reduction and analysis and models and computer simulations to get a 3D model of that magnetic field. So that's pretty cool to show. Uh, one thing I like to uh, mention is the daytime observations of Venus because that's pretty cool. Those days we observe at night and then uh, very often after a couple of hours, if Venus is up in the sky, we open up again with a different set of uh, astronomers and observers to perform daytime observations uh, of Venus, even though we are predominantly a nighttime observatory. So we really try to uh, get niche observations, do stuff that not many other observatories can do to get something exciting about Venus, for example. Hmm. Okay, but well, thank you. Interesting. And if, if I can answer that in a slightly different way than Nadine, so I outreach and education is my job. And so what I, I'll just second Venus observations. Um, but also add that I think oftentimes people are a little hesitant to show spectra. 
Um, and I, I'm not. And so beautiful spectra are something that I think um, is not seen enough in astronomy. And Espinon's does have, you know, it's a, it has a slightly messy continuum at times um, in terms of like looking at an image for a, a, a general public audience. But the Espinon's reduced data reduces absolutely beautifully. And um, the Anytime you can get for me the little gif of the rotate rotating magnetic field, that's really what catches the the eyes of people. Um, they don't often think about magnetic fields and and how I like to explain Aspidons is and and Spiru is that we have a magnetic field on our sun, but we don't know much about it. That's an area of active research. And the more that we study other stars, uh, the more we will learn about their magnetic fields and thus our own sun. And seeing those little images of the rotating, um, uh, the gif of the rotating star with the magnetic field is, I love them so very, very much. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't know, I don't see your name. I just see Canada, oh, France. Sorry, it's uh, Mary Beth Lechak. Okay, Mary Beth. You know, I'm glad you mentioned the sun and its magnetic field because uh, recently I've been involved with the eclipses, the total solar eclipses. And there's a company called Predictive Science uh, Analytics, I think, or PSI, that creates or simulates the magnetic field of the sun or what it's supposed to be doing during the eclipse. And they give a model before and about a week after the eclipse. And I'm curious if this a comparison could be done with their model with, for, with your, with your uh, telescope and or if you can observe the sun during an eclipse while you don't have the eclipse at your location and then be able to compare the simulated field with what the actual measurement is. Yeah, I think observing the sun would be not possible with CFHT um, since we're not a solar telescope, but I would be can, I would be interested to see like what the simulations for the sun are and compare it to you know, a G-type star. Sorry, a G-type okay. star, okay. like, yeah. star that like- A G-type star that like- Sorry, a G-type star that Espadon okay, has observed. Okay, I'd love to get your email. I mean, this conversation can go on and on for a long time, but I'd love to get your email if you can write in the chat room and I can send you more questions and or links to the simulations. Yes, love that'd be it. fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, other questions for Nadine? <laughs> 